Hi everyone, E here with E's list of things you should give a crap about this week. Thanks for tuning in. Starting us out today is a honeybee hostage situation. This story is off the AP wire and it's one that honestly I think um, is a source of uh, renewing our, our faith and belief in, in, in humanity. Um, and it comes uh, out of Kentucky, Danville, Kentucky. That's right. I said a humanity story out of Kentucky. I know. Wonders are possible. So anyway, there's a group of customers in this store and they found themselves trapped when honeybees decided that the store was in fact a perfect location to set up a new colony. Before you start thinking the store patrons were a bunch of wimps or wusses and why didn't they just run through la la la. We're not talking 10 bees or 30 bees or even 50 bees. We're talking about a million bees, literally 1 million bees according to the story. How they got the estimates I'm not sure. But 1 million bees <laughs> were at this store. So I'm sorry, but if I was there, you know what I would do? I would have two questions. Where's your snack owl? And where's the restroom? Because we're going to be here for a while. I want to get comfortable. Maybe ask for a sleeping bag or something. I don't know. But I know I wouldn't be moving. So for, to, for a little background, for those of you who, who don't know, I mean, I think most people are, are to, to some extent aware of this unless you've been living under a rock. We have a serious situation with honeybees and that they've been uh, dying off at startling rates and and I think the situation's improved maybe in the last year or so but but it still is not um, completely resolved. This is a serious problem because of course honeybees through their pollinization process um, help to um, create the blooms that then create the fruit and vegetables that we all eat. So, so goes the honeybee, so goes humanity. If they die off, humans are not far behind. And in fact, Einstein even said that. So it must be true. Anyway, in this situation, uh, this was a honeybee version of a Lifetime movie channel. Uh, our Lifetime channel movie. I mean, this 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 is really hilarious. Again, not sure how they know this, but, but this is the deal. This is the story. So, apparently... There was a colony of bees. They had a queen, of course. Every colony of bees has a queen. And um, the queen died. So this colony of bees is like, what in the world? We need another queen. So they go out. They search for another queen. They, they find one. And she decides to take them all in. But then, of course, she's like, I got my own kids. Now I got my sister's kids. We can't all live in this one-bedroom colony. I got to find a new home for us, you know. So she goes out on the hunt. Everybody else is just following her. So she decides that this storefront is the perfect location. I mean, she's not, she's not really thinking about the humans. But, you know, here's a great example of how we're all just uh, creatures trying to share this same little speck of dirt we call Earth. So it is what it is. So anyway, so uh, the the queen bee and her kids and her adopted kids were trying to share the space with a bunch of terrified customers. It wasn't working out. The rescue workers are called, and uh, for some inexplicable reason, someone knew that there was a couple not far away in Perryville, Kentucky, um, Joyce and Gary Taylor, who... Uh, were experts or had or had expertise in honeybee or in bee removal. Uh, so I suppose they're kind of bee whispers, if you will. So um, Gary and Joyce come over to remove the bees. The the rescue workers and the firefighters block off the roads, <laughs> kid you not, so that they have the space to, to do their work. Now remember, these customers are trapped in the store this whole time that people are driving from Perryville and streets are getting blocked off. So this is probably going on for a while. <coughs> but all told, long and short of it, the tailors were able to successfully negotiate the relocation with the queen bee, you know, they, they talked it through somehow, I don't know, some bee talk, and <coughs> got her to agree to move the colony somewhere else. 
and uh, the patrons <laughs> were freed from the store, and apparently no bees or humans were, were harmed in the process. So that's a pretty cool thing. DreamWorks, if you're listening, I think there's a nice family movie in this one. So check. So there's the story there. Um, next we got Tech News, and Tech News, uh, there was a merger, a pretty big merger this week, announced um, AT and T and Directv. I know this is the Mick paper. Uh, USA Today had the headline. It's 50 billion, basically 48.5 billion. Sometimes I, I understand that USA Today is light news, but sometimes I like them for their graphics. I mean, let's be honest. Who hasn't seen a USA Today graphic every once in a while they didn't like? Seriously. But anyway, so the reason I bring this one up, besides the fact that Grandma Bell must be proud of her grandchild, AT&T, for uh, gobbling up stuff again, um, this merger ha has a, a few ties back to last week's story on the on the FCC uh, policy changes and net neutrality. Um, so, for one, uh, cable subscribers are in the decline in households. In fact, again, see USA Today graphic. It shows here that from 2004 to 2014, so basically 10 years. Well, 10 years. There's been about an 11 million subscriber drop to uh, cable uh, cable TV subscriptions. So cable subscriptions are dropping, but as I'm sure all of you know, anecdotally and personally in your own lives, what has happened is it's not necessarily a reflection of a lack uh, or a decrease in consumption of television or, or media on the part of consumers as much as it is a, a shift in what people are what or how they're receiving uh, their content. So um, in comes Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu Plus. Uh, so a lot of people are turning to these as alternatives to cable. Um, AT&T is aware of that, and of course, um, part of what this uh, merger does is help to balance AT&T out with the TV services, right? The holy grail of multimedia tech is voice, data, and um, television or, you know, um, uh, content like that or movies and stuff. So with those three of those three things, AT&T's weakest link is clearly TV uh, providers because uh, on the USA Today uh, thing, what they show is AT&T has 5.7 million TV subscribers. DirecTV has 20 million. Comcast has 22. Time Warner 11. Dish Network has, or Dish TV has uh, um, 14 million and Verizon has 5 million. So you, you notice that the thing is that Verizon and AT&T are two of the largest phone, um, mobile phone providers. They're one and two. But when it comes to television, they're the smallest. So part of this is AT&T trying to balance themselves out. Um, but it's also them prepping, right? Um, in, in addition to making them real players when it comes to TV subscribers, it gives them more leverage when they're negotiating prices for, for content and what will likely end up being the fast lane price negotiations if the FCC ruling uh, uh, rules change allowing for fast lanes when it comes to, um, to certain types of content over the internet. So I'm not entirely sure. This is another thing uh, about this deal that kind of struck me, and I'm not entirely sure how ultimately it's going to play into it, but I'm positive that it's a factor. So in terms of the Dish, you know, TV, you got Direct TV and Dish, right? Or I'm sorry, satellite television options. You have Direct TV and Dish and Dish Network. Well. Dish, as I say, they only have 5 million or 14 million subscribers, uh, which is significantly less than the 20 million to DirecTV. But let me tell you what else Dish has. 
Dish has, remember last week I was talking about the freed up analog spectrum that became available like open real estate when there was the move over to digital television and now we have all our HD TVs. Okay, so that, uh, Dish Network has been buying up spectrum real estate like a drunken sailor. Dish is like, let me see, how shall I put this? Dish is like the dude who's awkward and unattractive and no woman would give him the time of day until she finds out he's a trust fund baby. And then all of a sudden he's like hot and one of the city's most eligible bachelors because he's a trust fund baby. You know that's what makes him attractive. Money makes a man look good. So that's what Dish is right now. Dish is looking good because Dish has bought up all the spectrum. And so in terms of long-term capacity... Um, they are a very attractive merger prospect for other companies. I don't know. Again, I'm, I'm speculating here. I don't know if this plays into AT&T's decisions about DirecTV. I'm sure, you know, on, on, on its face, the number of subscribers is, is reason enough in terms of being able to leverage that to um, in negotiating prices with with uh, content providers and that kind of thing. But I'm pretty sure that, again, we go back to the open spectrum, uh, the FCC rules, and and um, how you can really make the most of what's kind of a wild, wild west situation right now with all of that. So, um, again, in the end, not sure what it will all mean, but stay tuned and keep watching because one thing is for sure, and that is that um, all of these, the mergers, the change to the FCC rules, the um, additional spectrum space, all that is going to have a content on on me, on you, on us as consumers in terms of um, pricing and what's available to us and the variety of things that are available to us based upon um what sort of, uh, what is the final result when all the dust settles. Um, last story of the day is the Mongolian squeeze. So, um, in the world news, poor, poor Mongolia. You may be thinking to yourself, what is she talking about? I didn't see anything in the news this week about Mongolia. What in the world is, is our problem? Okay. If you were thinking that, you'd be correct, and that's part of what worries me. Russia and China this week announced a 30-year uh, natural gas deal um, for $400 billion. So um, what this is, is Russia has the, the natural gas, um, you know, as a resource, obviously an energy resource, and China needs it. Because they are they are sucking up they are sucking up energy over there. So I mean, not that not that I'm talking because Lord knows the U.S. is the worst culprit, but still I'm just saying. So uh, Russia and China have kind of been working on this deal, and they already do some exchange. You know, they've been kind of working on this deal for a few years now, but they never quite got to the to the point of really signing the ink on this particular gas deal up uh, up until now. But now, recent events have increased the motivation and incentive to get it done, which is why they did it this week. For one, on Russia's side, with the whole situation with uh, uh, the Ukraine, Europe and, and, uh, and U.S. sanctions over the Ukraine activities um, have put the squeeze on Russia, and that only exacerbates the fact that Crimea is an energy a, an energy resource dependent uh, place. They don't produce their own resources. So as soon as as everything started happening, where you know uh, Putin and Russia were <laughs> trying to annex Crimea. They were all what they were also doing effectively is annexing Crimea from their their uh, sources of of energy. This is clearly a problem for Putin because um, he does not want a situation where people start you know um, 
sort of lashing out because they don't have lights they they can't run their cars you know they their refrigerators won't stay cool because uh they don't have any resources so with with uh all of the sanctions coming out of europe and u.s and the u.s he had to find another way to um to do this now part of the reason it's taken so long to get this deal done with china is that china is kind of like the walmart of countries when it comes to buying um and so china you know where it, it, like if you if you go to walmart and you're like i have this product that i would love to sell in your stores i want to charge 19.99 that's what i'm charging at all the other places where i'm selling it walmart would be like well you will sell to us for 1997 and if you don't sell it to us for 1997 we're not putting it in your stores in our stores so so what are you going to do you're going to sell to them for 1997 because they have that kind of buying leverage that's the situation with china china's like uh guess what putin you may be able to charge uh the europe uh, a rate for your gas your natural gas that is equal to the way that uh crude oil is evaluated or um or um price but you're not going to charge us like that because we can otherwise get our um energy sources from other south uh southeast asia countries um that will just pay the price that we tell them to pay so in the end the 400 million dollars they didn't actually say how much uh was the what the actual charge was um or you know per what you know how much uh per cubic however they measure natural gas i don't remember they didn't say how much but it basically worked out someone of course back figured the 400 million to a 30 year deal and figured out that basically russia paid a little bit or i'm sorry russia got a little bit less than they than they get from european countries and china paid a little bit more than they would pay to south east asia countries but so not so it was what uh, a deal should be most of the time and that neither party got exactly what they wanted but each party got it a little bit better than than what was originally on the table now for china's part they had a different list of motivators for one the environmental pollution kind of stuff that's going on um with with coal and other less clean sources of energy that they've been burning are causing a whole health host of problems from health problems for people to um to affecting the antiquities in china and with suit and uh starting to have a really uh negative effect on them in addition to that China is a little bit irritated with the U.S. right now too because of these espionage charges uh, that the U.S. leveled um, earlier this week, the end of last week, against Chinese government workers saying that they were hacking into um, private company uh, uh, computers to get um, trade secrets and win competitive edges and so um that that really kind of pissed china off so i'm pretty sure on the wall street journal this was the picture they had on the cover and i'm pretty sure the toast the toast that they made to that was screw the u.s screw europe boom so um all of this uh is is a way of both these countries kind of showing that flexing their muscle and saying you know we can we can still be just fine even without europe and the u.s okay but you're probably saying for real what's this got to do with mongolia i'll tell you here's my special effects let me show you okay i don't know if you guys can see this all right so here's russia here's china oh what's this blue spot that's mongolia poor mongolia because here's the problem I don't know if you guys have noticed where should i put my wait let me put my prop over here uh, can you can you see it still okay there it's right it's right there anyway here's the problem i don't know if you've noticed but how shall i put this neither russia nor china are countries known for their 
sensitivity to neighbors or um, consideration for what other countries might might want that could be affected by their by their actions. So let's see, Beijing. Beijing is about right here, okay? And Siberia is somewhere about right here. So let's just use this line. Where does it go right? Oh, it goes right through Mongolia. Right through Mongolia. So the problem is um, both uh, there's going to be along with the, the uh, 400 million dollars that they agreed to there's going to be a 75 billion dollar pipeline that runs from Russia to China um, to transport this uh, this natural gas now there are there are a couple places here like right over here see right in this area here where Russia meets directly up with China but the fact is what I suspect is the most direct route to get that that natural gas from Russia into China is gonna go straight through Mongolia so this is just something that I'm mentioning to you to you guys because I want you to keep your radars out for it I think that as this moves forward Mongolia is gonna run into some real serious problem because Russia and China are gonna be like we really don't care what you all want. You hear? Yeah, I didn't see a single story where they were like, "And this is what Mongolia thinks about this deal." But believe me, they will be affected. So um, I just think that's something that's going to be interesting to watch. Um, I'm way over my time now. It's about 21 minutes, so so I'm going to wrap up. One thing I I just wanted to mention a final note. I'll be doing a special edition this week on Brazil. Um, and the uh, reason I want to look at it is because uh, the World Cup is starting in Brazil in June. So really just in a few weeks. Then in 2016, they have the Summer Olympics. And let me tell you, there, there are so many things going on in Brazil right now in terms of, of uh, uh, challenges to pulling off these two big events. I mean, it's going to make the roast that happened to to Russia with the Winter Olympics look like child's play compared to what the the world's about to do to Brazil over these two so I just want to talk about that a little bit do that later this week um, until then you all have a great day and thanks for watching bye bye